our message. So I wanted to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 10 as we'll conclude this section about lifestyle choices. And certainly our lifestyle choices should be such that Paul says, uh, as it says here, that they may be saved. That's uh, a phrase out of uh, one of our closing verses here in verse 40, 43. Uh, he's talked about the fact that he himself personally is all things to all people so that some might be saved. He says to the Jew, uh, I'll, I'll be as an Orthodox Jew. I'll keep every ritual there is uh, that I might be able to share and witness to them. To the Gentile, I'll, I'll be like a, a, a Gentile and if the Jews aren't around, I'll have pork chops with them and uh, do what I can to see the Gentiles get, uh, get saved uh, as well. All things to all people, making cultural adaptivity so that other people can be open to the gospel of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Never in sin, never compromising the word of God and so forth, uh, but uh, doing all that he, he can. That's the section that we're in and that we've been in for a while. Last week we looked at the fact that, uh, <laughs> that um, God provides a way out uh, when we're under temptation. Uh, we said it was one way, the way out, we're to pray, to trust, and keep our hearts and minds focused on uh, Jesus Christ. But uh, uh, he begins this section with a, a therefore. He's already told us in verse 18 to flee fornication. Uh, and here he'll tell us to flee uh, idolatry. And, uh, and again, this has been his theme back in chapter 8 as well, this idea, what do we do about idolatry? What do we do about uh, food sacrifice to idols? And uh, we, we certainly uh, don't think that that's a, a big concern for, uh, for any, anybody here. But at the same time, there's uh, principles and application uh, that I think uh, apply to us. And when we talk about an idol, of course, it's uh, very broad. And I'll give you uh, what the Bible says are six ways that you could be falling into idolatry. I think you might be okay on four. You might have trouble with the last two. Uh, but again, it's putting anything before God, anything, whatever it might be. It could be a relationship, an education, or a career. It can be an idol if it's more important than your relationship with, uh, with God. Uh, for, uh, for some people, it might be Facebook. I just came across this, uh, and I'm on, and I'm, I check mine all the time, so uh, don't, don't get too nervous here, but I thought this was an interesting uh, article sent to me. It's, uh, it was uh, uh, based on a book, uh, How to Build Habit-Forming Product by Nir Eyal. He's a game designer, and he's a professor at Stanford, and he talked about the fact that it's not just that you come up with a good app. The app really needs to be addicting if it's going to be, uh, uh, be successful, and that's called captology. In other words, it's you build into the app something about it that will capture a person's uh, attention uh, and then keep capturing uh, their attention uh, so that they, it's hard for them to, uh, to escape. Uh, and he says this uh, uh, in the interview, a successful app creates a persistent routine, a behavioral loop. The app both triggers a need and provides the momentary solution for it. Feelings of boredom, loneliness, frustration, confusion, and indecisiveness often instigate a slight pain or irritation, prompt an almost instantaneous and often mindless action to quell the negative sensation. Gradually, these bonds submit into a habit as users turn to your product when experiencing certain internal triggers. And, uh, if you're on Facebook much at all, I think you could say amen to that. You realize that uh, standing standing in line, it's like, well, it's kind of boring. Take my phone and start talking Facebook. You just do it. These guys know what they're doing. It uh, it works. Uh, there's a lot of things like that. I read that as an example: is that uh, things can capture our minds and our attentions uh, when they really should be on the Lord. So many things can become an idol. So again, why should we flee idolatry and why should we be concerned about it? Paul gives several reasons and I've kind of captured uh, them in really into two. The, the first one is that we are partakers in the body, uh, in the blood uh, of, of Jesus Christ. Now he's going to use several key words before I start reading the text. I wanted to point out to you, one is that word partaker, meteko uh, in, the, in the Greek. It means to share, to participate, by implication, to belong to 
So when we're partakers in communion, uh, we're saying we belong to Jesus Christ. We are participating in something together uh, that is unique, that speaks of his death uh, and his, uh, his body being broken, that we might have eternal life. That's a key word in this passage, uh, partaker. The other word is the word we're familiar with, koinonia. It's translated fellowship, but it's also translated communion. And Paul is saying that we have those things in communion when we're uh, taking the Lord's uh, table. Let's read the text and you'll see those words, hopefully, as we jump out a little bit as we go through. Verse 14 to 18, our first uh, point. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. There's the command and then here's the reasons. I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the, there's our word koinonia, communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the, the koinonia, the uh, communion of the body of Christ. For we though many are one bread and one body. For we all, there's our word partake, uh, by implication we belong to each other, of that one bread. And we'll talk about what that one bread is. Observe Israel after the flesh are not those who eat of the sacrifices, and there it is again, partakers of the altar. So that's an Old Testament illustration. Paul begins by getting a little dig, dig in here. I guess I have to appreciate this a little bit since I'm given slightly to sarcasm at times. Uh, but he says, I speak to his wise men. See, they claim to be wise men. You know, and they, they were, they were uh, had rejected a lot of what uh, uh, Paul's ministry to them, what he had to say, because they were so wise, you know, because they were uh, schooled in the philosophies and the Greek thinkers uh, of their time. So he gets a little dig in here. I speak to his wise men, <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe you can judge rightly in listening to this. And he gives a, a reasonable argument. He says, first, again, rejecting idolatry, we're partakers with Christ when we take the elements of communion. I don't know if you're aware, there's three different uh, views of communion within Christianity. Transubstantiation, and uh, yeah, when the first time I heard that word, I did have to work on it a little bit. I was glad that it was in my spell check once I did type that in. This is a view of Roman Catholicism, uh, if you're not familiar with it. It is the view that when they take communion and the priest stands over those elements, the cup and the bread, and he blesses them, they somehow they become physically the body, the physical body and the physical blood of Jesus Christ. That is why if there, and it, this has happened, if there's a Catholic parish on fire, a priest will risk his life to run up to the altar. Somewhere up there, there's gonna be a special little box, uh, usually very ornate. Uh, he will open that door because there's going to be a bit of that wafer that's left in there. And since that's literally the body of Jesus Christ, he will grab it and try to run out through the fire to save the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is the view of Roman Catholicism. Therefore, uh, when they talk about being saved by grace, grace is a process. Uh, and you attain that process through taking the physical body of Jesus that physically is broken uh, each and every time they have the mass uh, and therefore by taking uh, the body of Jesus Christ into them they are attaining uh, the grace of God and if they do it enough and do it the right way and over a long enough period of time they might attain the, the grace of God very different view of course than the Apostle Paul uh, in Ephesians 2 2 8 transubstantiation Consubstantiation is the Lutheran view. Now remember, remember Luther was uh, doing his best to be a good, a good Catholic monk, uh, and he certainly wasn't trying to divest himself of uh, Roman Catholicism uh, when he uh, studied uh, the book of Romans uh, in the original language that he was very skilled in, uh, and he came to the conclusion that we are saved by grace and by grace alone, and it's not by works. And so he led the Pro the protesting against that view within Roman Catholicism where we get our word Protestant, where they were protesting against three things. Uh, they were saying that uh, unlike what Roman Catholicism says, we're saved by grace alone. Uh, uh, we, are, we have the scriptures of the authority uh, alone, 
uh, in the priesthood of every believer. Those are the three, uh, the three pillars of, uh, of uh, Protestantism. But, uh, of course, uh, Luther didn't completely reject uh, any of the other views of Roman Catholicism. So his eschatology and so forth is, uh, uh, is the same as are, are the Reformed churches today. Uh, consubstantiation. Uh, they believe that during communion, when they pray for the elements, the elements themselves do not physically become the body and blood of Christ, but somehow next to them becomes the body and blood uh, of Jesus Christ. So as we take them, uh, we're taking those elements of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. What's the difference between those two? About that much. <laughs> There's really not a big difference between the Lutheran view uh, and the Roman Catholic view, other than a couple of key words you have to memorize on a test to get the right answer uh, in systematic theology. But they're, they're very, very close. Uh, and it's good to understand these things. I've seen Calvary Chapel guys fall into transubstantiation. Uh, it's, it happens. Uh, and uh, and part, of the, part of the problem is if you, uh, if you spiritualize texts when you teach them, it says this, but it, it, uh, it really means this, and you get away from a, a literal rendering the best you can, uh, you can err uh, in many ways. The other view is the view that most evangelical believers have today and that these elements are important to us, they are powerful to us, and they are symbols of what Christ did. When we take the matzah and we break it, it is a symbol of Christ's body. His body was broken. It's a historical fact. It really did happen. And this symbol reminds us of what he went through. When we take the cup and we drink the wine, which is uh, the wine that Jesus created, uh, the wedding feast, which would have been, we call it grape juice. Again, in the Greek and the Hebrew, it's the same word for both. One's fermented, one's not. But uh, either way, we take the cup. It reminds us of the blood uh, of Jesus Christ. I want to tie a couple of things uh, into this because I think it's, it's certainly an important subject for all of us. We take communion once, once a month here. Uh, and sometimes maybe we don't have the full realization of uh, what it is that we're doing or what it possibly could mean or should mean. Uh, sometimes because it's brief uh, at the end of the service, uh, we might uh, uh, already have our mind set for where we're going for lunch and, and uh, whatever else is going on. But it's meant, to, Paul says, uh, to be a time of koinonia with the Lord himself, uh, a very special time. Now, he writes about this in the second letter to the same church, 2 Corinthians 6, 11, and he says this. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restric restricted by your own affections. Now, in return for the same, I speak uh, as to children, you also be open. So here's, here's a, you know, hey, we love you guys. We're connected <coughs> with you guys. Here, here's the exhortation. Uh, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ and Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? That's our subject. How can these two things go together? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them. And walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't fall into idolatry. You are to come out from that. Why? Because we have communion with the Lord. Every time we take the Lord's table. Later he's going to say, how can you do that and sit down at a table uh, and have communion with demons at some temple somewhere? I don't think any of us are doing that, but the point still is, are we being conformed more to the world than to the, the, uh, the image of Jesus Christ? Because there's a great opportunity, apparently, for us to have communion when we are at the, the Lord's table. So his point, how can we be involved uh, in, uh, uh, again, in idolatry? Now, the, the other aspect uh, about communion that is left out greatly uh, in most churches, even the evangelical churches that believe that it's just a symbol, uh, is the idea that, oh, by the way, this comes from a Jewish Passover. And if we don't really understand the context in which it's getting, uh, we're certainly not going to understand a key phrase in this, uh, this particular verse here. And we're going to miss by implication a lot of what goes on. So that's why sometimes we, we don't do it every year. It's just a lot of work. 
But uh, when we try to have a, a Passover, if you haven't come, I'd encourage you to come to see the whole thing uh, in, uh, in context. It's important, which leads to our, our second point. As partakers of the bread and cup, we have unity uh, with, uh, with each other. Verse 17, for we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Now, again, this phrase of the one bread comes right from Passover. Passover is, uh, is built around four questions, four questions that deal with uh, the children of Israel being delivered out of Egypt, the angel of death passing over, the plagues and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, everything is built around the four questions. It's built around four cups, four cups of wine that are, that are, that are, are drank. One of them actually we don't drink because it's a remembering the plagues. We just put our finger in the cup and then put it on the napkin and we say, frogs, lies. You know, we go through the, the, the whole thing remembering what God delivered them from. But uh, on the night when Jesus had his last Passover supper instituted the new covenant, what we know as the Lord's table, uh, he used the third cup, which is the cup of, uh, of redemption to say, now in this cup is represented my blood, my, my life that is going to be poured out for you. The significance of the cup of redemption and why it's called that, it is to remind the Jews around the world today uh, that take uh, that time of Passover that that cup of redemption represents blood that was put on the doorpost uh, of the homes in Egypt so that the angel of death would pass over. They were delivered by the blood of a lamb. Uh, and uh, in the same way, Jesus took the cup representing the blood of the lamb and said, this is my blood given for you. So a, a Jewish context helps if we understand what, what these things are all about. That's important. But here he's really focused on the one bread. What is the one bread? Well, again, the other aspect of Passover uh, is the fact that you eat a lot of bread. You eat a lot of matzah. It kind of goes with uh, uh, lots of different things and aspects uh, uh, of the service. But there's a point in time uh, at the head table uh, where, uh, again, the leader will, will pick up a, usually a, a beautifully ornate uh, linen bag, and there's three matzahs inside, three whole matzahs inside. He will remove the, the middle matzah, and he will break it in two. Uh, he'll put the other back. He'll take that one, and he'll wrap it in linen or a white napkin, and then he'll hide it. It's hidden away. At the end of the supper, after it's all over, then he's going to ask the children to go and find it. And whoever finds it, they get a reward. It gets redeemed. Uh, it's that, we call it the afikomen. That is the one bread. Uh, that is brought back, and Jesus takes it and says, this is my body broken for you. Very significant, because it's the one, it's the one bread Paul's talking about. It's not the many matzahs or breads that have been eaten during Passover. It's the one that represents, if you think about three in one, I mean, the, the Jews, you know, they have explanations. It's, it's, the, it's the Levites, it's the priests, it's the this, it's Abraham, Isaac, it's Jacob. But uh, we know that uh, God is in a triunity. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's the middle one, the Son, that is actually broken, that is wrapped for burial and put away. He is redeemed. He comes back. And it's his body that we take uh, that's been, uh, been broken. Uh, and again, we, we kind of go through these things, and I kind of explain a lot to you guys as, uh, as we do it. We talk about why it's necessary to be matzah that's uh, with uh, un unleavened, unleavened bread. That's important. I remember, I remember growing up uh, in, uh, in churches, and, and uh, for display sake, uh, maybe at the time of communion, they would have a little, a little table up front, and they would have a, a beautiful, maybe a silver cup there that represents the cup of, of communion. Uh, and then they would have this uh, big loaf of French bread or something, you know, it was just massive, you know, which uh, uh, by implication means that Jesus had sin in his life. And, uh, you know, and it's got like six layers of lacquer on it, you know, so it looks beautiful all the time and it remains there on the, on the table. One guest speaker was uh, shocked one day as he was talking about the importance of communion and he thought he'd go for a visual aid. He held the cup up and talked about it. He took that big loaf and he, he held it up. He thought it was just a, a fresh loaf of bread. And he went to break it when it did. That, that loaf that was probably six or eight or ten years old uh, exploded in dust on everybody in the first three rows. Didn't quite make his point. 
but again, the, the symbolism is important. Jesus, uh, again, with, without sin. Uh, let, let's read. I, I, I want to. Uh, Paul's already brought up this idea of uh, the importance of uh, Jesus and what he did for us, saying that we were bought with a price previously in chapter 6 and verse 19. If you just look over there a couple pages, he says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, uh, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, uh, which are God's. Uh, again, we're uh, purchased at a price uh, that is symbolized in the communion elements. The cup is the cup of redemption, uh, and the one bread is the afi kolmen, uh, which represents the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's hidden. It's been brought back. It's what redeems us from our sins. Uh, again, early in the ministry of Jesus, uh, he had made reference to this. He's in John 6. I'm going to read a couple of passages. He's talking about the fact that he is the bread of heaven that's come down. He's going to really relate that to the manna that was in the wilderness. But he's going to re relate it directly to this idea that we've been discussing here, uh, being the bread broken for us. In John 6:35, 35, uh, again, John writing that Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He's the bread of life. Uh, later, a couple of verses, verse 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, and the one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Uh, and the bread that I give is my flesh, which I shall give for, uh, for the life of the world. He's talking about the afikomen. Uh, I will give my life. It is the bread come down from heaven. If you believe in me and you put your faith in me, you'll have eternal life if you eat this bread. If you eat his flesh, that sounds, yeah, uh, Christians in the first century, there's a great rumor that they were cannibalistic because they ate the body of Jesus every time they, uh, they got together. People thought that was a little strange without much uh, explanation. Uh, but again, Jesus is making the point, Paul's making the point, the one bread uh, is Jesus, it's the symbol. Why should we have nothing to do with idolatry? Well, because of the communion that we have uh, in, uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, because of that cup of redemption, which represents to the Jews the blood of a lamb that saved them from slavery uh, in Egypt. But to us, it's the blood of the lamb that saves us from, from sin and death and hell for all eternity. Paul says you should think about that when you have communion. You probably won't be involved in idolatry when you think about these elements, the communion, the koinonia, uh, being partakers. And then he, he has, uh, throws in an illustration from the Old Testament, the idea of being partakers uh, illustrated there, verse 18. Observe Israel after the flesh are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. And again, a little explanation is helpful. There were two, two sacrifices if you brought them in, a peace offering and a fellowship offering. That basically, if you brought your lamb or whatever you brought it in, a, a portion of it then would be literally, that, you know, the animal would be butchered. Uh, a portion of it would go on the altar and it would be burnt on the offer uh, as a sacrifice to God. The other part basically would get grilled. <laughs> And then uh, and cooked, and then uh, you would sit there in the temple with your family, and you you would eat it. God is is uh, taking His portion. Uh, you're taking your portion, uh, and you have fellowship with Him. You have communion uh, with Him. It was it was as close as you could get uh, get to the Lord. Again, it's because in uh, Middle Eastern culture, even today, as it was in the first century, this idea of eating together is very important. We have food; it's in common. Uh, you're eating your portion. I'm eating my portion. Yeah, you're you're receiving the same nutrients. I'm receiving the same nutrients. We are becoming one together because we're eating together. It's a very big deal still to this day. Uh, people ate with God in the temple. That's what Paul's talking about. Partakers uh, in common. So we're partakers in the blood and the body of Christ. By remembering Christ's death, we enter into communion. Uh, we enter into fellowship, to koinonia, partakers together. Why in the world or how could you be involved in idolatry? Therefore, the exhortation to flee idolatry. Secondly, 
Uh, the second reason that we should flee idolatry is that we're warned not to provoke the Lord. That's in verse 19 and 22. What, I, what I'm saying then, that an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything. Rather, the things with the Gentiles or an unbeliever sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So again, a couple of things about this idea of provoking the Lord, which certainly should be a, a, a concern of all of us. We'll provoke the Lord if we have anything to do with idols. Is that, is that pretty clear? Is the idol anything? No, I can't speak. It can't hear. It can't talk. Uh, it's just an idol. It's just a stick and stone or whatever. Uh, it's not uh, uh, anything. Uh, but it's something that uh, uh, can uh, cause uh, tremendous problems uh, in our lives in terms of our relationship with the Lord. Uh, to the Jews in this church, this was not an issue. They, were, uh, they, they, uh, they spent 70 years in captivity in Idol Central in, in Babylon. I mean, it's, this is the, the mother of idolatry is, is Babylon. Uh, you to appreciate God's uh, sense of humor. Uh, I want to cure you guys from being involved in idolatry. You're going to Babylon. I guess, that, you know, if you catch your kid, yeah, 14, smoking a cigarette, so you make him smoke a big cigar, so he'll be sick as a dog and never do that again. It's, that's the kind of thing. Some of you are going, people do that? I don't know. They used to. But, uh, <coughs> uh, but you get the idea. Jews have nothing to do with idolatry uh, be, be, because, of, because of that. Uh, Mo, again, Moses writing in Deuteronomy 4, uh, very clear, verse 15 and 16, Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you uh, at Horeb, uh, out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly, uh, make for yourselves a carved, Im carved image in the form of any figure. And then he goes on, I don't care if it's human, I don't care if it's animal, I don't care if it's a fish, I don't care if it's the stars of the heaven or the moon or anything else, uh, don't make any forms uh, at, at all, anything that uh, would, you would worship. Then in verse 20, but the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt to be his people, an inheritance as you are this day. Uh, so again, he delivered you out of, uh, of the land of idolatry in terms of uh, Egypt. And the way he did it was through, you remember, the plagues. Uh, and those plagues were all designed to destroy the concept of idolatry uh, in the uh, hearts and minds of the children of Israel. Uh, again, there was, uh, they worshiped the Nile, so God had it turned into blood. Uh, they worshiped frogs, so he let frogs overrun the entire country. I don't know about the lice thing. No, but actually that was an aspect of it. There's been some very fine scholarly work that details uh, the primary gods of Egypt and relates them all to the plagues. Uh, and God, again, was punishing them and trying to, uh, again, set a time so that the children could be delivered out of the horrible conditions that they were in there, the children of Israel, but it was all designed against uh, idolatry. So again, so what are the idols that we should be concerned about as New Testament believers? And I, I mentioned that uh, there, there are six. I'm going to run through them uh, pretty, pretty quickly. If we're to flee idolatry, what are we to be concerned about? Well, the first one is the obvious, uh, the worship of any kind of image or statue. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just say this uh, as uh, <laughs> politically correct as I can. Is this an issue in some aspects of Christianity today? Are there any churches today that you can walk in and they have carved images? There's a few. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. I don't understand because it's completely forbidden, uh, yeah. Old Testament and, and, and New Testament. So th this is not a, uh, is uh, the whole idea of idolatry uh, making a comeback in our own culture? Af absolutely. Uh, and it's all under, that's ethnic art. No, that, that's an idol right there. <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Christian beware. Uh, it's not just a piece of, uh, Paul says, it's nothing and have nothing to do with it. Uh, we need to be careful. Uh, secondly, the worship of angels. Uh, angels have made a big comeback in the, via the New Age movement. Paul says uh, in Colossians 2.18, uh, let no one cheat you of your reward uh, in terms of heaven. Take and delight in false humi humility and worship of angels. Uh, you can walk into any New Age bookstore uh, and there'll be a, a plethora of, uh, of books on angels and how you can know them and worship them and have a relationship with them and, uh, and so forth. Uh, that's a type of idolatry. Three, worship of any kind of spiritual being outside of God, God himself. 
Again, Paul makes the, the connection between idolatry and, uh, and demons. Uh, and, uh, and that's why uh, in, uh, in many false religious systems, uh, you actually have a real spiritual activity. Uh, if you study or look at, uh, uh, you don't see it so much in this country, but in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, there's a lot of strange supernatural things that happen because there's demons involved in that particular uh, type, type of worship. Uh, and were to flee, have nothing to do with that. Paul says, uh, excuse me, this is John writing, book of Revelation, chapter 9, verse 20. This will be happening. Again, our world is being uh, conditioned for these things uh, right now. Uh, he's, uh, John writing says, but the rest of mankind uh, who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands, that they should not worship demons. And idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, hear, nor walk. Uh, uh, but it's growing. It's a big deal. For worship of the dead, uh, and again, the children of Israel were, uh, again, exhorted not, not to do that. Psalm 106, verse 28. They joined themselves also to Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices made to the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with, uh, with their, their deeds. Does that go on? Yeah, I, st I stood at um, uh, Tiananmen Square uh, on more than one occasion and watched, uh, and watched Chinese people line up uh, to the tomb of Mao Zedong uh, so they could, and many of them, not all, but many of them, uh, believed that he was deified and they, they would worship him. Uh, that's, that's big and open, uh, uh, a name you're familiar with, but uh, it goes on uh, around the world uh, again. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to bet right now everybody's like 0 for 4. No sticks and stones in my house. I haven't worshipped an idol lately. No demons, no angels. Everybody good probably so far. Here we go. Materialism. Oh, see, these are the last two. They'll get you. Also stated in the Bible as covetousness. And this is from uh, Paul writing to uh, the church at Ephesus, chapter 5, verse 5. For this you know. That no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God in Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not, there's our word, do not be partakers uh, with them. In other words, the stuff, the stuff can become so important to you, it takes the place of God. That you're living for the stuff. And, uh, and therefore... Uh, when you can't fit the stuff in your home any longer, we will build massive high-rise buildings to contain your stuff, <laughs> known as storage units. But uh, we got small houses in Hawaii, I realize. But uh, don't have a, a garage; you got to put it somewhere. But we got a lot of stuff. But when the stuff uh, becomes more important to God than God, then that's idolatry. And uh, and Paul's given us uh, some pretty good reasons why we should not be uh, in, involved uh, in it. I, I, I would say this. It's interesting that, again, Calvary Chapel was kind of born out of the Jesus People revival of the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And one of the reasons the hippies were uh, so open to the gospel uh, and so many of them came to the Lord is because they had already rejected materialism uh, and to live for materialism. They were looking for love. <laughs> and, and Jesus is love. So they, they were really, as a culture, uh, they were really primed uh, for, for the gospel. Uh, six is sensuality. Uh, that's a type of I idolatry. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm going to read this from the uh, New Living because I think it makes it a, a little clearer. It will help us. Philippians 3.18. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, uh, there, there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. And, and uh, uh, New King James says their stomach, but it means their body appetites and not, not just food. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. They live for the things and the body appetites uh, here uh, in this life. Sensuality is a type of idolatry. So if we are involved in these things, and we shouldn't be for very good reasons, we provoke the Lord. Secondly, we provoke the Lord because of our involvement uh, of demons. Verse 20, uh, rather the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, and again, that's just a reference to unbelievers. Uh, they sacrifice to demons, not to God. I do not want you to have fellowship with uh, demons. So his uh, logical uh, arguments here, 
idol is nothing. Uh, you, you eat meat offered to, to an idol that's nothing, then the meat's not affected, it's nothing. But you also have to realize that probably not in all cases, but in many cases, uh, there is a spiritual element uh, because when people are seriously uh, and serious about worshiping an, an idol, uh, Satan is more than happy to, uh, to uh, basically send off one of his, uh, one of his um, uh, entities, one of the, the demons, uh, to receive that worship uh, and maybe uh, do a couple little things uh, of a supernatural uh, nature. Uh, to uh, impress the, the followers, to draw them in uh, a little bit more. Uh, but again, it's all enforcing this idea that we read earlier that we should be separate uh, from, from sin itself. Uh, be careful what we bow down and worship. Three, we provoke the Lord when we attempt to partake of the Lord's tables and demons uh, at the same time. And certainly uh, that, that makes sense uh, and, uh, and we need to be careful. Anytime we get caught up in the worship of something else other than God, when we care about, it's our priority, it's where all of our thinking is, when our life is, uh, is wrapped up in anything, any place, a person, a behavior, uh, we could be falling into idolatry. And I, <laughs> again, came across uh, 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 a very interesting quote this week from, from a non-believer. And uh, Bob said this to me. Uh, it's, uh, his name is David Foster uh, Wallace. He's a, an award-winning uh, author uh, and uh, university professor uh, and, uh, yeah, who took his own life in 2008. Very troubled person, brilliant guy, but very troubled. Uh, and uh, at a commencement ceremony, uh, he said the following. Uh, this is a non-believer uh, saying this. He says, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And pretty much anything you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are uh, where you tap real meaning in life, then you'll never have enough. Uh, worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you'll always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you'll die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power. You'll feel weak and, and afraid. You'll need even more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. You'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. He's right. He's right. The Bible says, whatever you worship, you'll become like that. You'll become like that. I agree. It will eat you alive. Choose wisely who you worship. Flee idolatry, Paul says. Why? Because when you do it, you're provoking God. And secondly, we partake of communion and what God has done for us. If we understand all those implications, we should flee uh, idolatry. This leads to, again, a very clear principle. We want to keep our life together, again, uh, avoiding the temptation we looked at last week, fleeing idolatry and, and uh, being conformed to the image of this world instead of the image of Christ so that we can win others. Here's the clear principle we're to follow, verse 23, 24. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. So the clear principle here is that with freedom, you have responsibility. With freedom, you have responsibility. <clears throat> when you first get a driver's license, and um, I've seen the, the glow on a few teenagers' face uh, recently, having received their, <laughs> their driver's license. Very, very exciting time. Uh, in, in their lives because it affords them tremendous freedom, tremendous freedom to be in the car and drive and go anywhere. Along with that, it's kind of scary, right? I mean, because there's a lot of responsibility that goes along with it. In the Christian life, it's the same, Paul says. We have a lot of freedom, but we have uh, a lot of responsibility uh, uh, as well. Uh, secondly, the clear principle should cause you to ask two questions, Paul says. The first one is, is it helpful? What I watch, what I listen to, the friends that I have, what I'm involved in, is it really helpful to my relationship with Jesus Christ? I mean, I have the liberty, I have the freedom. Is it really helpful? Paul says you should ask that question uh, uh, all the time. Secondly, does it edify? Or again, that word just simply means to be built up, whatever that relationship or thing you're doing or association and 
uh, Proverbs warns all the time about don't associate with the angry man. You'll become like him your, your, yourself. Uh, Paul, uh, writing later in chapter 15, says, uh, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Or again, uh, bad company corrupts good character, the NIV says. So again, teenagers, be careful. <laughs> Mom and dad, be careful. But we all need to be careful. Uh, whatever the freedom that we have, it's limited by our love and the desire to see other people come to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Two good reasons to not be involved in idolatry. Partakers in communion, avoiding provoking uh, the Lord. Uh, a clear uh, principle uh, about uh, our responsibility of limiting uh, our, our lifestyle choices based on our love for others. And now he gives a very practical illustration. At least it was pra practical for the Corinthians. Uh, we'll have to uh, uh, make it practical for us. That's in verse 25 to 30. Eat whatever is sold in the marketplace, uh, asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe <coughs> invite you to dinner and you desire to go, uh, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? Uh, but if I partake with thanks, why am I spoken of? Uh, why am evil spoken of for the food over which I, I give thanks? So uh, lays out an example, a couple examples. Uh, we could say one deals privately, one deals publicly. Uh, and then uh, he deals with a little, but I know you're going to say this. And, he, uh, and he'll deal with that. Uh, the practical advice for our behavior uh, privately. And basically, uh, hey, if, you, uh, if, you, if you've got some meat, uh, and uh, don't worry about it, an idol's nothing. Just take it home and, uh, and uh, eat it and uh, enjoy it. Uh, uh, you might wanna, it's, it's all the Lord's <laughs> in all of his fullness. It, uh, it came from the Lord. Uh, the cow grazing out there didn't know he's gonna be sacrificed to an idol one day. Uh, just eat it, man, enjoy it. <clears throat> all things. It's, it's, it's not an issue. It's not a problem. Privately. Privately. But then he says, our public behavior is different. He says, uh, secondly, <clears throat> you, you go to eat and, and with somebody else in a public setting or in their, in their home. Uh, this person is an unbeliever. Uh, and they say, hey, we're having steaks. All right. And then they say, oh, by the way, this was previously offered to Zeus. What do you do? Well, in the privacy of your home, it's like, I don't care. <laughs> the idol's nothing to me. But in front of this guy, oh, no, thank you. I can't do that. I can't do that. Why? Because of your conscience? No, because of his conscience. He's wondering, how committed are you to Jesus Christ? Do you give up anything to be different than anybody else in the world because of your commitment to him? Or are you like everybody else? Is there any difference in your life uh, what's, whatsoever? It's an opportunity to witness. No, I can't, I can't really do it. I can't really do it. I, I got to tell you uh, an illustration. I certainly uh, have listened to thousands of hours of David Hawking, so I, I know of a few of his stories. But this one cracked me up. Um, and, and it obviously has to do with this. He meets a guy. He's, trying, he's sharing with him and stuff, trying to get to know him, build a relationship with him. Hopefully you'll be able to share the gospel. And the guy says to him, he says, uh, Hey, do you like horses? Oh, yeah, man, I like horses, yeah. Okay, I'm I want to show you some horses. You know, I love horses. I'll show you some horses. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> he, he, doesn't, he takes them to Santa Anita. He takes them to a racetrack. This was like 20 years ago. I don't know if you would frown on someone going to a racetrack or not today, but there's gambling, so there was a, a day within Christianity that you, a Christian would not go to a, a racetrack. So here's David Hawking. He's, he's, uh, he's going to the racetrack with a guy. Uh, he's trying, but he's going to go. He's making a cultural adaptation, right? I mean, it's not sinful for him. He's just going to go and watch the horses run. And, uh, and then the guy says to him, he says, well, here, we, 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 got, we got to pick a horse. We got to put a, put a bet down. David says, I don't gamble, man. I just, you know, it's my own personal convention, conviction because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Work pretty hard for my money. I just don't feel like the Lord would have me to do that. That's my own personal conviction, so I really can't do it. He's made a cultural adaptation going but he draws the line where it might be sin for him. So he sends a message to the guy. The guy says, that's fine. Well, I'll, we'll just, I'll place the bet. Just kind of, you know, if you were to look at the list of these horses uh, in this first race here, which one would you pick? You're not betting, but which one would you pick? <laughs> David looks at the list. 
And there, there's a horse running called predestination. <laughs> I picked that one right there, predestination. Oh, are you crazy? It's 40 to 1. What are you, nuts? He goes, well, you asked me to pick. I like that horse. And so anyway, the guy says, well, I'm not picking that horse. And he picks another one. You can almost guess what happens. Predestination wins going away. The guy comes back. How did you know that horse was going to win? That's unbelievable. I didn't know it was going to win. I just like the idea of predestination. What's the idea of predestination? Well, let me tell you. He tells him, and the guy prays to receive the Lord. God is good. I mean, he made a cultural adaptation, but he drew a line uh, in terms of his own pers personal conviction. Paul says what we do privately, as long as it's not sin and so forth, we always still have to ask, is it helpful? Does it edify? That's one thing. But what we do out in front of others when we're trying to win them to faith in Jesus Christ is a, is a very different, different thing. Paul says this <clears throat> on the same subject line uh, in writing kind of the closing chapter of Romans there, Romans 14, 14. He says, I know that, and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. You know, if, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy your food uh, with your food, the one for whom Christ died. So basically, he says, if you're alone, eat. If you're not alone, no eat, brah. <laughs> Sacrifice to an idol? Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> and, then, and then explain why. Of course, it's, uh, that's not the issue for us, but there's lots of other issues uh, that, that are out there uh, that are pertinent to uh, are we really Christians or not? Is there really something different about our lives than others who don't know the Lord? Now, Paul deals with, has to deal with these two objections because somebody's going to say, why should I not enjoy food for which I've given thanks? Hey, I prayed. I give thanks. I, why shouldn't I be able to eat anything I want? Why should my liberty be limited because some other guy's got a weak conscience? Now, those are the two lines uh, at the end. So now he answers that uh, in, uh, in verse 31. Uh, to win the lost, we must live to please others. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. That's our, our, our theme. And really, uh, the next verse in chapter 11 fits right with it. He says, imitate me just also as I imitate Christ. So we're, we must live to please God. Verse 31, what do you do? Do it all for the glory of God. you got a couple questions to ask about lifestyle choices. And, and in the end, does it glorify God or, or not? Our lifestyle choices should. Uh, we must do our best to live a life to please others if we really want to see them come to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Give no offense. He divides the world into three categories. You've got Jews, you've got Greeks or Gentiles, and you have the church of God, which is made up of both. So he's talking about uh, not stumbling, uh, caring about, because of your love, others in the church, and then those that are out there uh, in, uh, in the world. Uh, again, just as I also please all men and all things, not seeking uh, my own profit. Paul wasn't a compromiser. He wasn't a compromiser uh, in any way in terms of sin or, or, or the word of God. Uh, but he cared about others. He wanted to see other people come to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Just closing real quick, five, five questions, and uh, I'm going to read through them. They're from Warren Wordsby and his commentary. I thought they're very good. Again, lifestyle choices. This kind of concludes our uh, several studies on this subject. Uh, here's five questions. Uh, uh, some of these will reiterate some of the things we've already mentioned, but I thought they were very good and included them in, in your notes. In making the decision about lifestyle choices, will it lead to freedom or to slavery? <clears throat> will it make me a stumbling block or a stepping stone? Will it build me up or will it tear me down? Will it please me or will, they, uh, will it glorify Christ? Will it help to win the lost to Christ or will it turn them away? So these are, these are the things that should guide uh, along with our conscience uh, decisions we make we're not talking about whether something's a sin or not, whether it's covered in the Bible or not. It's just all the other things in life, uh, lifestyle choices. I think it's important because I think there's a lot of Christians out there making a lot of bad choices. Uh, there's a lot of Christians that are out there 
<laughs> I'll be talking to someone and they'll say something like, oh, I didn't know he was a Christian. That's not a good thing. <laughs> that's, that's not a good thing. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, you, not that you have to carry a big King James Bible around with you, punk people on the back of the head of it and, uh, and uh, point out the fact that you're a believer, but th there should be a little distinction uh, in your life. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed from it by the renewing of your mind. Uh, and again, the J.B. Phillips translation says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, because that, that will happen if we don't fight against it, if we're unaware of it. Amen.